A Guide to Growing Amaranth Sometimes referred to as pigweed, amaranth varieties have been cultivated for thousands of years. The cool thing about this crop is that it can be harvested for both its grain and its leaves, and there are different varieties for each type. Amaranth grains are highly nutritious and are similar in appearance to quinoa or couscous. Bonus, they're gluten-free. Amaranth varieties. Purple amaranth. Similar in appearance to Prince's feather, purple amaranth has erected panicles with red or purple flowers. Its leaves can be all green or all purple. Prince's feather has bright red-purple flowers that grow in erect panicles at the tip of the plant with green leaves. Love Lies Bleeding. This variety typically grows to two to four feet and is distinguishable by its hanging panicles of blood red flowers that grow from the tip of the plant. Its leaves are typically green. Joseph's Coat. Named for its defining multicolored foliage, green, yellow, purple, gold, red, and pink are all common colors to see in the leaves of this variety. It needs around six hours of direct sun, but prefers an afternoon shade. Amaranth should be directly sown when soil is at least 65 degrees Fahrenheit, and also when frost is no longer a threat. As well, germination is best when soil temperatures stay below 77 degrees Fahrenheit, 25 degrees Celsius. During germination, air temperatures shouldn't go below 68 degrees Fahrenheit or above 86 degrees Fahrenheit. It's also important to thoroughly weed the garden bed ahead of planting to limit any competition. Amaranth prefers light, well-drained, fertile soil. As well, seedlings can be blocked from sprouting if the soil has a crust. So use light, non-compacted soil with a low clay content for growing amaranth. Here's how to start amaranth seedlings. Step one, plant the seeds a quarter inch deep in full sun. Step two, space out the rows about two feet apart to make weeding easier, to reduce competition, and to promote good airflow which helps to prevent fungal diseases from festering. Step three. Now, all that's left is to wait. Grain amaranth in particular is slow growing in the beginning, so just be patient. Amaranth needs warm temperatures throughout its entire growing season, which is 40 to 50 days from seed harvest. Though it doesn't do well in extended periods with temperatures above 95 degrees Fahrenheit, 35 degrees Celsius. Amaranth also needs full sun, though the Joseph's Coat variety will do well with some afternoon shade. Amaranth does best in soils that are fairly neutral, with a pH between 6 and 7. Amaranth can also tolerate fairly extreme conditions once established, and it can grow in slightly acidic or slightly alkaline soils. Here is a step-by-step -step guide to caring for amaranth. Step 1. Before planting any seeds or transplants, thoroughly weed the garden beds to remove any competition and to reduce the risk of pest problems. Step two, prepare a garden bed that gets full sun and has loose, uniform soil. Turn the soil under at a depth of about eight inches, then smooth it over using a rake. Remove all rocks and crumble up any large soil chunks. Step three, Amaranth will grow well in rich soils, so add organic matter, like compost. Work it into the topsoil, then make sure the surface is smooth and level. Step four, plant amaranth seeds a quarter inch deep in rows about two feet, 60 centimeters apart, with six to 18 inches between the seeds. Seed closer together to ensure a successful crop, then seedlings can be thinned later. It should take about 10 to 14 days for seedlings to pop up. Step five, water the seeds or transplants after they've been planted. If seeds are being sown early in the season, the soil should still have a lot of moisture, 
so don't drown the seeds. Then, seeds won't need to be watered again until they have germinated and have two to three leaves. When watering amaranth, do so in the morning so that the plants have the afternoon to dry off, which helps prevent fungal growth. Keep the soil evenly moist, but not wet. Step six, thin larger grain varieties so that there's approximately 18 inches between the plants in a row. Joseph's coat, however, is a smaller variety and will grow just fine with only six inches between each plant. Step seven, when seeds have germinated and the seedlings are still small, mulch can be added to keep weeds from popping up. This is an important step to do, especially when the amaranth plants are young. Keep mulch away from the plant's stems and leaves to avoid fungal and or bacterial growth. Fertilizer isn't needed when growing amaranth, but if the soil is known to be poor, then it's in the amaranth's best interest to add some fertilizer. Do not add nitrogen fertilizers, as these can cause the toxic buildup of nitrates in the plant's leaves. Mulching can be used to keep weeds at bay, which is particularly important for your young seedlings. Just be careful not to cover the seeds, as they don't like to be buried. Mulching is also a good way to regulate both soil temperature and moisture. It's only needed in the early stages of growth, though, because most amaranth varieties grow tall and wide enough that their leaves keep the soil well shaded. Direct seeding is better when planting a large amount of amaranth, but transplanting can be done if only a few plants are wanted. Start amaranth seeds indoors about six to eight weeks before the last frost, making sure not to move to outdoor soil until there's no more risk of frost. Seeds should be sown thinly and covered in a thin layer of rich soil, keeping their air temperature around 68 degrees Fahrenheit during germination. Seeds should germinate in about 10 to 14 days. Seedlings should be kept by a window where they can get a lot of direct sunlight, but fluorescent plant lights can also be used. To use these lights, set the plants about three to four inches from the lights for roughly 16 hours a day, adjusting the light as the plants grow. A week before transplanting, harden off the seedlings. Simply move the plants outdoors to a sheltered spot where they won't be damaged by wind, rain, or sun. If there's going to be any risk of frost overnight, bring the plants indoors. This hardening off process will get plants used to the outdoors and increase their chances for growing success. Amaranth can be companion planted with eggplant and scarlet runner beans. The good news is that amaranth doesn't have any garden adversaries. Amaranth can be grown in either garden beds or containers, though it mostly depends on the number of plants being grown. While growing amaranth in a pot or container, make sure the container is big and deep enough to provide room for root anchorage as the plant grows. Just keep in mind the different sizes of the grain varieties as compared to the vegetable varieties. Joseph's coat is much smaller and won't need as much room. Amaranth weevil. This insect feeds on plant leaves as an adult, and as larvae, they live in the hollows of roots and stems, causing them to rot. Here's what to do. Make sure to monitor plants closely, and if you see infected plants or individual plants wilting and dying, pull them right away and kill them. This may seem extreme, but you want to prevent the spread of the amaranth weevil because there isn't much that can be done to prevent them entirely. After harvest, it's also best to burn or bury the crop, or the crop can be left until the first frost. Aphids. These tiny pests come in a variety of colors, green, black, red, light orange, or yellow, and mainly feed on the undersides of leaves and stems. What they're actually feeding on is the sap in plants, which ends up causing the plants damage. 
Aphids also leave behind a sticky substance called honeydew, and they are a pest that's known to spread diseases. Aphids can be tolerated by most plants when their numbers are low, but if there's a lot of aphids, they can stunt a plant's growth and cause a plant's leaves to turn yellow and fall off. Here's what to do. For the most part, plants can handle mild aphid infestations. But if they're found, a strong jet of water from a garden hose will wash them off the plants. Spraying plants with water should be done early in the morning so that the plants can dry off during the day. Sticky traps, neem oil, insecticidal soaps, and horticultural oils are also effective against aphids. Just be sure to follow the application instructions on the packaging. Oftentimes, you can also get rid of aphids by wiping or spraying the leaves with a mild solution of water and a few drops of dish soap. One variation includes adding a pinch of cayenne pepper. Soapy water should be reapplied every two to three days for about two weeks. As well, you can try to attract beneficial insects like lady beetles, hoverflies, and lacewings, all of which are important aphid predators. Make sure to check all transplants for aphids before planting. And keep in mind that aphids aren't very mobile, so it's not uncommon to find one heavily affected plant surrounded by plants that are fine. If this is the case, simply remove and destroy the infected plant. Cutworms. These are gray worms that curl their bodies around the stem of a plant and feed on it which causes the plant to be cut off just above the soil surface. When their numbers are high, they can cause severe damage to the garden by causing plants to wilt and die off. Cutworms feed at night and hide in plant debris during the day, and they prey more on nutrients plants, seedlings, or young plants since their stems are more tender. There are a number of different types, but the most common are red-backed, dark-sided, and dingy cutworms. Here's what to do. Hand pick any cutworms from the plants after dark, when they're most active. Also, keep a three to four foot buffer of dry soil along the edge of the garden to make it unattractive to cutworms. As well, remove plant residue to help reduce egg laying sites and get rid of weeds, which can host young cutworm larvae. Be sure to till the garden before planting, which helps to expose and kill any larvae that might be present. Also, use compost instead of green manure, since manure might encourage egg laying. As well, try placing aluminum foil or cardboard collars around the plants to create a barrier, which will stop cutworm larvae from feeding. Simply place the collars around the plants so that one end is pushed a few inches into the soil and the other end is several inches above the ground. Adding a layer of mulch will also help to prevent any cutworms from reaching the soil surface. And natural predators like wasps and ground beetles also help to control cutworm infestations. Finally, try spreading diametaceous earth, essentially a soft powder made from the bones of tiny aquatic creatures around the plant's base. This creates a sharp barrier that will keep cutworms out. Leaf Miners Leaf miners are small dark flies with triangular yellow markings that start out as yellow maggots. They feed on the leaves of a plant, creating irregular round-shaped mines slash tunnels on the leaves. These mines slash tunnels are long and narrow at first, but eventually will become an irregular shaped light colored patch. This damage can stump the growth of plants and cause the leaves of plants to turn yellow and drop. In extreme cases, severely infected seedlings can also die off completely. Here's what to do. Monitor plants for signs of these pests, paying close attention to the undersides of leaves. Typically, leaf miners can be removed using a stream of water in the early morning, and certain sprays are good to use too. Natural predators like ladybugs and parasitic wasps can also be attracted to keep leaf miners away. But if these pests are spotted on any plants, simply pick the bugs off and then carefully remove any damaged leaves. 
Insect netting can also be used to prevent leaf miners from attacking any plants. As well, keep in mind that soils should be plowed under immediately after harvest if any crops were infected with leaf miners. Spider mites. These tiny spider-like pests are about the size of a grain of pepper and can be red, black, brown, or yellow in color. They feed on plants, sucking on the plant juices and removing chlorophyll, which is important for a plant's ability to turn sunlight into energy. Then the mites inject toxins into the plants, which causes white dots to appear. Also, affected leaves will become dry and yellow, and those affected leaves can drop from the plant entirely. Oftentimes, there's also some webbing visible on the plant, and the plant's growth can be slowed. Typically, spider mites multiply quickly and thrive in dry and dusty conditions. Here's what to do. Monitor plants for signs of spider mites, paying close attention to the undersides of leaves. Spider mites can sometimes be controlled with a forceful spray of water every other day, and it's best to spray them in the morning hours. That's because when plants are sprayed early in the day, those plants have time to dry off, which avoids bacterial or fungal growth from taking place. Hot pepper wax or insecticidal soap can also get rid of spider mites. Just be mindful that certain sprays can also kill off the natural predators of spider mites. Since these natural predators, like ladybugs, are good bugs to have, they should be encouraged in the garden. Damping off. This is one of the most common problems when starting plants from seed. Seedlings will emerge and appear healthy, then suddenly they'll wilt and die for no obvious reason. Damping off is caused by a fungus that thrives in moist conditions, and when soil and air temperatures are above 68 degrees Fahrenheit. It can also thrive when soils have too much nitrogen fertilizer. This fungus favors slow-growing, deeply seeded plants. The stems of affected plants become water-soaked and will eventually collapse, while roots become too water-soaked and damaged to function. Older plants can also be affected, and either those older plants become stunted or they will collapse. Damping off can be spread three different ways, either in water, by contaminated soil, or on gardening equipment. Here's what to do. When possible, plant disease-free seeds. Keep seedlings moist, but avoid overwatering the seedlings to keep the soil from getting too wet. And try to keep the soil from getting too cold. Raised beds are usually a great option for planting, since raised beds help with drainage. Also, avoid over-fertilizing seedlings and thin the seedlings out to avoid overcrowding and to make sure the seedlings are getting good air circulation. If containers are being used, those containers should be thoroughly washed in soapy water and then rinsed in a 10% bleach solution after each use. If any plants are affected with damping off, remove them from the garden and then practice a crop rotation of two to three years. When growing for grain, avoid harvesting the leaves. Amaranth seeds are ready for harvest in the late summer to early fall when they easily come off the plant, usually about three months after sowing. As well, small garden birds enjoy amaranth seed and they can be a good indicator of when the grain is ready for harvest. Ready to harvest? Here's how. Step one. An easy threshing method for amaranth is to lower the flower head over a bucket and gently rub it in between your fingers or hands. And this should be done in dry weather. Luckily, amaranth has no hulls to remove. Step two, amaranth grain needs to be winnowed and dried before storing. Use a screen and a fan or another blowing device to clean the grain of all its chaff. Then, dry the seeds on trays in the hot sun or inside near a heat source so that they won't mold in storage. 
Stir the grains so they get as dry as possible. Step three, store amaranth seeds in a sealed glass or plastic container, somewhere dark, like in a cupboard, as amaranth grain is quite oily and can become rancid when exposed to light and air. When growing amaranth as a vegetable, once the plants are about 12 inches tall, their greens can be harvested. If the amaranth has been transplanted, then this should take about six weeks. Immature leaves can be harvested for eating raw as a leafy green, and mature leaves can be harvested for cooking. Simply cut the leaf stems with scissors as needed, or the whole plant can be single harvested for fast growing varieties, like Joseph's coat. When harvesting individual leaves multiple times, make sure that the scissors leave a clean cut. It's important to try to avoid any damage or tearing to the plant stem, because that's how bacteria and fungi can get inside. Then keep the harvested leaves cool, as with any leafy green, to prevent them from wilting. Next, all that's left is to enjoy.